All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. I am Arn van Oosterfjord, and I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. And um, welcome to our KCS Verified Vendor Series. And in this series, you get to hear KCS best practices from experts from our aligned and verified vendors uh, and or their customers. And for those not familiar with our KCS aligned and verified program, it's an elite group of tools that support the KCS practices. And in the case of our verified vendors, they've demonstrated they support all eight KCS practices and our aligned vendors are more specialized and they've proven that they support elements of the KCS methodology. And I'm pleased to introduce Michelle Stump. Uh, so Michelle is the KCS practice director at Right Answers and uh, Right Answers is a verified vendor. And she is a KCS V6 certified trainer and has spoken at many KCS Academy events as well as hosted KCS roundtables on launching and optimizing your KCS program. And in this um, Verified Vendor series call, uh, Michelle will discuss how you can enable your organization to successfully support KCS with technology geared around KCS best practices uh, and workflows. And, and Michelle just has a, a, a wealth of information on KCS practices, best practices and lessons learned. So we'll get to hear quite a bit there. Um, so some housekeeping before we begin, this session is being recorded and will be posted at the KCS Academy site, as well as sent out to all who registered. And uh, regarding questions, please post your questions in chat. Um, we'll be monitoring chat. We'll either bring them up to Michelle as appropriate in the flow, or we'll save them for the Q&A session at the end, and we'll have ample time at the end for Q&A. And while you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute. Um, and before we get started, we want to make sure you're aware of um, upcoming KCS Academy events. On Wednesday, November 18th, Alex Van Fossen describes lessons learned on OSI Soft's KCS journey and their experiment with a KCS Guild. So that'll be very interesting to hear what they're doing there. And then on Tuesday, December 1st, we'll have an Electrolux case study sponsored by Come Around, another um, verified vendor. And Electrolux will discuss their CAM strategy to improve their customer experience. Uh, and Lena Stormbinge, she is the head of digital services at Electrolux, and she'll present their CAM strategy, their success factors, the learnings, and their accomplishments. And Electrolux achieved incredible benefits, and you'll see that on the, um, the description, but really incredible benefits from their KCS implementation, and we look forward to hearing about that. And then finally, on Thursday, December 10th, you can learn how Akamai's KDE program developed a KB-driven problem management approach that solved the pitfalls of their root cause codes and case classifications. So that's going to be very interesting because you, you think of that linked article as that problem signature. So it'll be very interesting how Akamai has approached that. And you can register for these events at the KCS Academy site. And uh, Jennifer is actually posting the link in the chat also to, to help you out there. But I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Michelle. Thanks so much, Arnfin. I'm excited to be here as well. Love talking to um, my KCS family here, if you will. Um, so before we get into, you know, really just taking a look at some KCS best practices, you know, I always look in terms of, of KCS being how we've evolved knowledge management. I've worked in knowledge management for many, many years at this point. Don't want to date myself, but um, I know what the challenges from a KM perspective have been because I've lived them day to day. Um, and from KCS, you know, that standpoint, it's it's really about how we're evolving our people, our process, our technology, right? And we know that the challenges you know, in implementing involves that that evolution, right? So, you know, from a right answers perspective, you know, we're really committed here to KCS to make sure that our product supports the latest KCS best practices and, you know, providing those out of the box for you while driving innovation and automation, which is really focused on the whole KCS methodology and the processes that many organizations adopt to um, while rolling out that methodology. 
So before we get into evolving our people, our process, our technology, because I've got lots to talk about there, I wanted to mention just a few of our customers who do KCS. And, you know, as I'm talking about best practices today, you know, I'm really citing what's helped these companies be successful with KCS. So you could take those back as lessons learned and, and just things to think about in terms of how you can take your KCS to the next level as well. Um, one of my favorite things about KCS is that size does not matter. And I have seen that personally time and time again. The methodology is not one size fits all. So, you know, if you can do parts of KCS, you can do KCS, right? If you're a small organization, you can do KCS. If you're a large organ organization, you can do KCS. You know, the main point of KCS is, is really enabling teams to contribute their knowledge, their experience, their expertise. And you're also elaborating or enabling them, I should say, to collaborate through the knowledge. Um, and then ultimately, you know, at the heart of KCS, you may already be aware is trust, right? Trust is what actually enables you to evolve your people, your process and your technology, because you're enabling everyone to work in more efficient and more effective ways that benefits not only your employees, but your customers and your organization as a whole. So wanting to get a little bit more into the people, right? So, you know, we've got all kinds of people that we actually touch through our knowledge base. So you could have your agents, your analysts, your CSRs, engineers, subject matter experts, leaders, customers, and I'm probably missing a few here, right? You name it, you know, we have lots of different kinds of people that interact with our knowledge. So how do we evolve our people? Right. Evolving our people means we're building stronger, more capable employees, more capable leaders and customers. You know, you might be thinking, well, wait a second. Sure. But how exactly do we accomplish this and what does it have to do with knowledge? Well, you know, when we think about it, this might seem like a pretty simple concept. But one of the best practices to get you there is to make sure that you've got knowledge connected to all of the tools where your employees and your customers are working. But what does that really mean though, right? Well, it means you don't just stop at one tool or one place to provide that knowledge from, right? And that's something that we typically do when we're starting off with KCS or with knowledge in general. You know, we, we have a particular uh, issue or problem that we wanna resolve. We get knowledge right with that team that needs that. And then we kind of stop there. We shouldn't stop there. We wanna think about how we connect people across all of the tools that they use to do their jobs, right? And get them collaborative and just working at a higher level of efficiency. You know, what's the common ingredient? The common ingredient is knowledge, right? That's, that's really um, the key here. So just to give you an example, if I'm a knowledge worker, and I'm working on my cases in Salesforce, I can have knowledge at my fingertips. But what if that case also leads me towards a bug fix? Well, then I might also be working in JIRA too, right? And what about communities? More and more companies are actually using communities to help their customers collaborate, help themselves have that internal communication and collaboration happening. But if I'm a part of that community, well, I work there too, right? So why have to go all the way back to the knowledge base or to another tool to access the knowledge where I could actually have benefits in accessing it where I'm actually working. So my point here is that you want to look for ways where you can further integrate your knowledge with where your employees and where your customers are working. So if you really think about knowledge as being that common ingredient, right? core or center to how you succeed, you know, you want your enterprise tool map to keep KCS at the heart of it, right? I just mentioned center. That's typically what I like to do when I'm building out what my technology map looks like. I literally will start with knowledge as the core or the center of it. And then I can determine or design how I integrate knowledge with all of those different areas. So you have the ability to push the knowledge out to all of the tools, portals, communities, whatever the case may be but you're still connecting all of those really valuable connections to your knowledge. So essentially seeing that knowledge is connected with all of your enterprise touch points. And when we think about this in terms of KCS connected knowledge, right? You've got a strong KCS application and processes. This is really enhancing your KCS knowledge base through the connected knowledge. And, you know, one of the things I, I always love to share is, is companies that really live this, right? So Paychex, um, you may be familiar with who they are, right? They are KCS veterans of over 15 years, have really successful KCS uh, program going, and they've successfully done just this, and they haven't stopped. 
right? They continue to evolve and grow. So, you know, currently, just a couple of examples what they currently have going on um, is that they've got their knowledge base sitting in the middle of ServiceNow where their IT teams can access the knowledge, Salesforce where customer service teams can access the knowledge. And as I mentioned, they haven't stopped there. So they're really pushing out knowledge to different areas within the organization. So regardless of where people are working, they can actually access and contribute to the knowledge. And we've got many other customers that are following the same, co same concept, right? The point being is that you're not done once you implement your knowledge base where are your people right how are they evolving is knowledge accessible where they're working how can they contribute so you know just to give you some ideas of, of how you can expand upon it um, and then also another point is that once we've got knowledge in the center right how do we actually enable our employees to contribute what they know and you know i always go back to to you know um, Gallup State of the American Workplace poll that they had, right, where they found that companies actually use less than 40% of the skills that they employ. Um, and that always jumps out at me because I look at, you know, even organizations that do KCS, how much of the application do they actually enable their knowledge workers to use, right? And it goes beyond the creation aspect, creating a basic uh, knowledge article or being able to, you know, modify it, but many, you know, will put their foot down and say, you cannot delete. So I can't even clean up something if I create something in error, things like that. And it always pulls me back to this quote, right? Less than 40% of the skills that they employ. Um, but then also adding to that, also 60 to 70% of the workforce is disengaged with a purpose and intention of the businesses they work for. So how do we fix this? Right. So first of all, you know, I always have my KCS hat on. That's something I'm, I'm totally guilty of. And that's OK. I will. I'll own it. Um, first of all, arm your employees with the right tools so they can do the right thing and let them do it. Right. So you may have some really great functionality that you have at your fingertips. Are you using it and are you using it to your best advantage? Right. And if not, why? Why not? Why are you designing around scarcity and not abundance? Right. That's one of my favorite core principles of KCS. Um, you know, if you want to think about how you can actually improve your knowledge workers experience, start with the tools that they're using. Are you actually enabling them to do their best work, providing access to those functionalities you already have and some guidance in terms of how they should use them is going to really take you to the next level. Um, so I mentioned a minute ago, the, this principle of abundance, you may be saying, okay, what is that? And how does this concept apply to knowledge? Um, so when we think about designing our knowledge base, our processes around abundance, right? It means that we do not put limiting factors in place. So if somebody has the skills and they've proven their ability in writing content, you promote them to be able to publish. You don't turn around and say, well, we already have 10 publishers because that's actually designing to scarcity. Why would you not enable them to do something when they clearly have the skills to do so, right? So you enable everybody to contribute in valuable ways without putting limiting factors in place like this. And, you know, we know that when we have more people actively contributing to our knowledge base, it's more robust and more valuable than ever before. And this is really, you know, key, or I should say the result of the principle of abundance. Sharing knowledge and ideas just multiply, right? You don't lose knowledge because you shared it with someone else. You continue to gain knowledge through all of the interactions and experience. And I can tell you so many times where in the process of actually sharing knowledge, I actually walked away with learning more than I actually shared. So when you think about how that uh, translates to a knowledge base and put processes in place that support that, you will it will not be a mistake. You will definitely see the value and the benefit from that. And this is one of the topics of conversations I literally get into almost on a daily basis. You know, getting companies to see where they've actually designed something counter to what they set out to do. So you decided to do KCS or you're doing KCS. Well, yeah. Um, so that means you trust your employees, right? Also, yes. So enable them to create those high value contributions, kind of what I'm saying very nicely is put your money where your mouth is, right? If you are trusting your employees, enable them to actually create those high value contributions. So what functionality do you already have available today that you're not using or using to your best advantage? Use it, stop letting it go to waste. Um, and I'll say that, you know, this area is actually one of my very favorite aspects of my job is really helping customers figure this one out. You know, if you've got challenges um, that you'd like to throw my way, I am certainly game. I'm always happy for, for those conversations. 
Um, so getting into some of my areas here from the previous slide, you know, with KCS, we're looking to create a higher level of quality in the articles that we write. And we're doing it because we actually write them with our customers in mind now. But we also have to adhere to our company's content standard too, right? So you've got your AQI or your knowledge quality, whatever you'd like to call it. It should actually be a reflection of both sides of this. So on one side, is the article actually helpful to the customer? Would your customers consider this a quality article, right? In other words, did it solve their issue? Um, it could be as pretty as can be, as perfect in your, you know, as, as far as your company's content standard goes. But if it doesn't solve their issue, the company is not going to agree with you in terms, or sorry, the customer is not going to agree with you in terms of it being a high quality article, right? So both things need to be considered. But then, of course, it's also really important that the content that we publish does adhere to our company's content standards as well. Um, so when we take the time and, you know, make that investment in making sure that we have high quality articles, you know, a couple things that come out of this is that, first of all, we're providing content to our customers that they can actually use, right? So if you write articles that lack their context, and by customer context, I mean, how did they actually describe the issue, right? How will they find the article if we can't find the article based on what they're telling us, right? So when we think about, you know, if, if they search for those actual terms, how can they find the content if it's not captured? So when we score articles for quality, we make sure the customer's context has actually been included in that knowledge base article. And then in addition to that, being able to identify coaching moments where we're actually working to improve knowledge worker skills in creating the knowledge. And then also, I like to call this kind of a hidden benefit, if you will, I get, think a little bit strategic sometimes. Um, but through our knowledge quality and through capturing those scores and being able to show not only the scores but how we've improved is we can actually prove that our knowledge workers were able to not only solve customer issues but write quality articles as well. And this is one of the conversations I have that's, that's ongoing with companies, right? Leadership may have been apprehensive about the KCS approach, right? Um, where they, you know, enabled it kind of thinking, oh, this may or may not work, we'll see. You know, this is just another one of those tools that we have in our toolbox to show, look at how well it's actually working, right? So your knowledge quality scores can be a really valuable tool to show just how well our knowledge workers are doing or how quickly they've improved because you've made the investment in training and the investment in coaching. So, you know, as you're probably already aware, trust, I mentioned that before, right? Core principle of KCS here. And there's many points that can be made in terms of how this can help us continue to maintain that trust. So, you know, kind of like um, how that can come out of the knowledge quality. But thinking about, you know, how do we actually do it, right? You know, when we think about ensuring that we're actually creating quality articles, this starts with enabling your knowledge workers to become a part of the process. Um, you know, when I think about knowledge quality and I think about report cards back from when I was in school, you know, grading somebody when they don't have the visibility to what they're being measured on is so 1980s. I mean, come on, right? When you think about it, um, you know, I have a son in high school. He can literally see his grades every single day. I get an email every single time a teacher has graded one of his assignments. So he knows how he's doing along the whole entire marking period every single day. It's not necessarily always the case when it comes to knowledge quality, but it doesn't have to be that way. Why not get your knowledge workers in on it? So, you know, where you can have this get to the point where grading students is no longer a surprise come report card day, right? Why does it have to be that way with AQI? It doesn't. So let me grade my own stuff and then have somebody review and update that grade. And now you've got those real coaching moments identified. So you thought that title was good? Hmm, not thinking that's true, right? I don't agree with that. Um, so, you know, if they think that title was good and, and on review, it really wasn't a good title, it wasn't just that they wrote the title and then forgot to go back and tweak it, right? It's that they actually checked it off in the quality score that the title was good and relevant to the content. So now we really can hone in on the important items here and where they need to improve their skills. So we can actually get them to that KCS rock star status very, very quickly um, in terms of, you know, instead of just waiting for them to follow that. Um, path from one role to the next and then going through their weekly or, or bi-weekly coaching program. You know, this is all happening much, much quicker because we let them in on the whole process. So, you know, that said, I know it seems like it could could feel daunting, but let me assure you that it's really not. And the companies in the Right Answers KCS family are using the knowledge-based quality tool to successfully help them boost the effectiveness of their knowledge. 
And, you know, when you think about scoring articles for quality, you want it to be quick and easy, and it can be. And, you know, when I think of quick and easy, it's kind of one of those key phrases that I typically don't associate with knowledge management, right? Um, especially if you've held multiple roles in, you know, doing anything from content, whether it's writing it, curating it, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, when you know what we're talking about audits, it's hardly ever quick, and it certainly isn't easy. So when you think about accessibility to a knowledge quality um, function, right, where you can see it right on the actual article, keeping it front and center, you know, it actually does provide tremendous benefits, ones that we may not have have thought of, right? First of all, as an author, I've got the AQI as a checklist right on the article. So as I'm writing the article, I've got all those reminders and it's nothing I have to seek out. It's right there for me. And then second of all, letting the functionality do some of the work for me. Um, so, you know, in terms of the content standard, right? So if you have an automated quality check that hap you know, it happens automatically without having to lift a finger, that's fantastic, right? So, you know, a couple of examples that are, are fairly common are, you know, did I run a duplicate check to make sure there truly is no article like this before I actually create this new one. Um, so kind of not having to clean up a mess later, right? And did I run a spell check just to make sure it, it caught any of my spelling errors? You know, did I use enough keywords? Just a few examples of, of things that we no longer really have to worry about when we have an automated check in place. And then for ones that are not automatic, you know, being able to, you know, easily qu click to grade an article for each of the additional AQI uh, checks, right? You just want to be able to be able to do, right? So that's definitely going to be helpful. And one last thing I wanted to mention here, you know, it's something this easy. It turns into something that we can do for all of our articles, where we can start to shift away from using a sampling technique, where things can have inevitably fall between the cracks, right? You know, as I mentioned before, when we have knowledge workers involved in the process of grading articles for quality, and then we audit those articles, you know, we have a higher level of understanding and how they're applying their KCS skills or building them. And that leads us towards better coaching, better skills development, and then we know all of our articles are high quality. And the key is really being able to measure this, right? How do you measure knowledge quality effectively and not hit the point where you're wondering what you do with the data that you have in front of you? So a couple of the most commonly used dashboards, right, um, and, and things that you should be thinking about, you know, in terms of you know, we typically look at knowledge worker and that's where we typically stop. So there's definitely benefit to looking beyond that. So by knowledge worker, of course, we need to be able to see how the quality of the articles the knowledge worker creates is and how it's trending over time, right? Are their skills improving? Are they cutting corners? So, you know, where does that where does that fall? You could have a publisher that's been a publisher for nine months and they're kind of losing a little bit of faith or steam for whatever reason, and we see their quality go down. You know, if we're able to identify that quickly, we can get them right back on track. Um, by coaches, right? So a coach's view, for example, if I've got people coaching others to improve skills, it would make sense that we look at how the coaches are having an impact on quality. So looking at the quality scores of the person that someone is coaching to see how they're trending can help identify various things, including when we might not have selected a good coach, right? Because it's one of the things that they're coaching towards. Um, by collection is another area that may be of interest to you, right? You may be interested in determining what quality looks like based on a specific collection of content or even by a particular audience. Um, so things you might want to look at. And then also from a leadership perspective, looking at the knowledge base as a whole, right? Or each individual knowledge base article would definitely help you. So there's a lot of different reporting that you would have available at your fingertips um, by implementing a knowledge quality or AQI program. Um, so in terms of, you know, KCS, right, it's not all about having a, a standard KCS template. We know we have our standard templates that we use that have the problem or the question and the resolution or the answer. You know, we can get much fancier than that, but it's all built on that KCS foundation that you have put in place with all of those standard articles. So there's several different types of high value articles that you can look to create. I find that the, these three here are the top three that actually provide the biggest impact to our customers in terms of, you know, just really improving uh, customer use of self-service, reducing the number of calls that are coming in uh, based on particular problems or topic areas. So I want to take a quick look at each one of these three. Um, so first one here, um, decision trees and resolution paths. So you know, I said a minute ago that we can take these KCS articles and use them as a foundation. And that's exactly what you could do in a case like this. Um, and you could see my 
six boxes in the center here, kind of on the bottom of my tree. Um, those are your KCS articles. But I want you to take a little bit of a trip with me, um, just for one second, if you will, because I want to really lay out a use case of where this can be helpful. So, you know, one of the things that, that I always like to do is, you know, just really look for, um, in my own environment or in environments where I'm helping customers, you know, really take the journey as the customer and look and see what the customer sees and how that may be useful to them or how it may lead them to pick up the phone and call. Um, so from this example, right, I've gone out to Microsoft support site and you could do the same. This is a very recent um, print screen. So I have actually encountered an issue with my computer. I got that infamous, infamous blue screen, right, that appeared. So I said, you know what, I'm curious as to see what Microsoft has on this, right? I want to know why this is happening. And more importantly, how do I fix this? And quite frankly, how do I stop losing all the work that I just lost because the blue screen appeared on me, right? So I headed out to their site and I searched for the symptom I was experiencing, right? I got the blue screen. That's all I really know is, is the blue screen happened. Maybe a little bit about when it happened to me, right? So I've searched for blue screen, or you could search for blue screen of death, as some might like to call it there. Um, but anyway, how many articles do you think Microsoft has for this particular issue? Oh, take a wild guess. Or maybe just look at the screen on the right. 1.8 million results. You can't make this up. And yet at the bottom, they're asking me if the search results were helpful. Um, no, <laughs> you know, and I'm not being sarcastic here. Being honest, 1.8 million results. I will tell you, I went through several of the results to find out if any of these applied to my particular issue. And every single one on the front page did not apply to my issue at all. So I'm looking at this from the customer perspective, right? There are a lot of uh, articles here, right? And if you look at the titles, troubleshoot blue screen errors, windows help, Troubles troubleshoot blue screen errors, resolving blue screen errors in windows, the same title twice. Like it really is, does, it's very, very difficult to kind of look at and figure out what article should I even start with first, right? So already I'm getting very frustrated. Whereas had they actually provided me with a blue screen article that asked me a simple question, right? And looking at a bunch of their different articles out there, well, when did this problem actually occur, right? It occurs, so when starting up a computer, you may not see the text here, right? On startup, before signing into Windows, after signing in, um, after system update, after booting into safe mode, right? And so on and so forth. If they had simply asked the question, they could have routed me to the answer I needed. Um, so one thing of where they could have made this content easier. Another thing is their titles didn't even reflect where, when the issue was being experienced, right? Um, they were all just very, very vague titles. So, you know, when we're thinking about how do we apply this in our environment, take the customer's journey, right? Um, if you were a KCS shop, you'd have all of this clearly defined in your titles and in the content, right? And then you have all your endpoints. It's really just a matter of, you know, pulling this all together and creating this tree or this path for your customers to be able to follow or your employees as well, you know, getting people to the solution they need, it removes all of the hassle of finding so many articles. And hopefully you would not have 1.8 million that come up after a search, right? So, you know, typically what we see in KCS environments is that KDEs or SMEs, they'll work with the knowledge builder or knowledge workers to build this. Um, so once they determine what decision trees or resolution paths they actually need based on what would make the most impact to the customers, the employees, the organization, um, they will work with the knowledge workers to be able to put those in place. So a lot of benefits here, right? First, I think back to, you know, when I said a whole lot of articles came up, right? You're greatly improving the customer experience here because you're providing one article for them to identify with, open, and then follow the path from there. And, you know, once you've done a great job at leading customers down that path, you've actually reduced cases where they're reaching out to you for help. What good were Microsoft's 1.8 million articles to me? They weren't right? They didn't solve my issue. I've got to call them for help anyway. So, you know, thinking in terms of our customers and customers I've worked with personally here, they've reduced their high volume calls when they put decision trees in place. So they were able to identify what was causing them 
you know, what was making the most impact in terms of issues where they already had the knowledge and the knowledge base and sought out ways to actually present that content to customers in more meaningful ways. And this way was just one of those. So, you know, they were able to really reduce um, some reported 70 to 85 percent reduction of calls in those areas because they were actually able to put the knowledge they already had to better use for their customers. So um, just a great thing to think about if you don't already have something like that in place. Um, what my other favorite types of high value articles, um, we call them our checkpoint solutions. So easy to create. I mean, we're already going through the work of creating an article and it's really one click that adds a checkpoint to a solution or an article and you can add as many as you need. So there's really no limit there. And the benefits to this are profound from a customer perspective, but also internally. Um, and if we think about my blue screen example, right, um, this is one great use case for something like this. At some point, I'd have to do something which would require a reboot oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of a knowledge base article. So what do I do? Do I print screen that article? Do I take pictures of it with my phone? Um, do I print it? Do I bookmark it? Yes, I've done all of those in the past. <laughs> Absolutely guilty of all of those. Um, that way, you know, you can go back to the actual process itself, bookmark it, you know, or pull up your, your print or your print screen and, and keep following what you need to do. With the right path, I can check off the steps that I, I have actually completed and then it actually holds my place for me, but then it holds that article in my actual profile. So when I go back to the portal, it knows that I was working on this and I don't have to find it again, right? Because that's another aspect. How did I actually find this article the first time? Um, and then there's more. So, you know, if I'm a self-service user and I've gone through this process and I've opened up, you know, a ticket at some point, the agent who's working on my case can actually see that I use this article and where I actually left off. So what did I already do? Um, so instead of starting at step one or at the very beginning, they can just dive right into where they need to get to. Um, so no need to start at the beginning at all. And of course, that reduces customer frustration. Kind of impressive if somebody said, well, I've already seen you do this. Um, what happened there? And if there's a problem with an article, quickly identified it so they can jump in and fix it. And there's lots of different use cases here for something like this. I mentioned just one, you know, a multi-step process, for example. But another really popular use case here that we've seen are, are checklists, you know, especially popular with onboarding details, whether it's employee onboarding or customer onboarding. Um, we've seen customers have reported just a tremendous impact here. We've seen a tremendous increase in use of knowledge in areas where they've actually used these, especially where, you know, you can actually use them to curate a collection of content that you want people to see if they they're looking for something with a particular topic. So less calls and less questions coming in as a result. Um, so I mentioned a minute ago that, you know, an agent can actually get in and see what someone checked off when they were using a right path article. And, you know, we have some great functionality that actually lets knowledge workers see the full picture. And the one thing I like about transparency when we were talking about, you know, AQI and knowledge quality, getting them in on the process, right? That's all about transparency and seeing how things were graded and what their grades are. You know, how about actually providing the knowledge workers with the complete picture about the issue? And for me, it really starts with your self-service user, right? So they came to your portal, they searched, they found knowledge, and darn, something wasn't right. So they opened up a ticket. Well, now if you come in as that knowledge worker, you could actually see the whole path. What actually did they do on your portal? What did they search for? What did they view? You know, that way when you're jumping into dealing with this case, you're really ahead of the game because you have all of the information. But this really gets better. Let's say you weren't able to solve that and you escalated that to somebody else. Now, following KCS, right, we try to follow the search early search off in principle, right? And it doesn't only apply to our first level. So not only can the person that this got escalated to see what the customer searched for, what they viewed, right, what they actually did, but they can see what you did as well and what you searched for. So, you know, now they're really getting the big picture here. So why view articles that have already been viewed, both by my customer and colleague, right? Um, if they worked, this wouldn't be in my lap, right? Why search for the same terms, but why not be able to see what they were both searching for and how those searches actually evolved? You know, when you have data like this at your fingertips, you can more effectively work on issues. And, you know, don't forget, if anybody used one of those checkpoints, you can see what was checked off there as well. And, you know, this is one of those things where I sit with agents quite a bit on my travels to various customers. And this is one function that they really can't stop 
gushing about. They feel so empowered by it because it just gives them all of that visibility into, you know, the customer, but then also into what their teammates have done to work on the issue as well. And plus, they're very excited from a KCS point to, uh, perspective to point out that, hey, now I've got their search terms. So now I can, when I'm editing the article, make sure that if they didn't say or use those terms when they spoke to me, I'm still pulling those in. They're still accounted for, and they're excited that they're able to make that additional contribution to the knowledge. Um, another one I commonly hear is how the knowledge base is just one source of content that's used. And so many of our customers have really thought through this and pulled in content from sources other than the knowledge base, providing one place to find the content, but pulling it in from various sources with just one search, and they've seen great results from doing so. So think about you know, how you can do this in your own environment. So don't just limit your search to just your KCS knowledge base, right? Think about how a federated search can enable access to any sources that you specify. So not only where you search the KCS articles, of course, but other sources of content simultaneously, right? Where are people working? Think about that, right? We talked about that connected knowledge. This is another way that we actually pull in that connected knowledge here. So, you know, if you are new to the concept of KCS and thinking that you'll just add KCS articles into your non-KCS article knowledge base, I really hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but this approach might have a negative impact on your search results. So the typical recommendation is starting with a blank knowledge base and don't gasp when I say it, but it's something that most don't have the luxury to do because it may involve walking away from existing knowledge that you have and that knowledge still has value, right? So in this case, you could actually build your KCS knowledge base from scratch, still retaining access to your existing knowledge through the federated search. And then my favorite thing about this type of concept is that it's so easy to pull content from the old or your pre-KCS knowledge base into your new one with just a click. So, you know, I like to call it KCSifying my content, right? So I can KCSify that older content as you're mov moving it into your KCS knowledge base. So putting it in your KCS template, making sure the customer's context um, is included, all those great things that makes the KCS article so successful. And then a great thing with this concept is that you've also got usage stats. So through the knowledge base, even if they use content from another source, you can actually see what was used. So you can prioritize what gets pulled over in the next, you know, content upload, if you will, right? If you're prioritizing what you turn into KCS content or prioritizing what gets updated from a different documentation aspect, you've got those, those really clear cut stats to tell you in the scheme of things, the bigger picture, right? What's actually important, what's being used. So even if you're not new to KCS, where else are your users working? Confluence, Jira, Community, SharePoint, your company website, right? I could keep going and going all day long, right? So, you know, when we think about pulling the results from multiple locations, it's going to enhance everyone's experience with using your knowledge base. If you don't have it, they're still finding it through you, right? So there's definitely benefit there. So in terms of KCS, we all know that regardless of whether or not we're doing KCS, publishing speed matters. The longer a time it takes to publish content to self-service, the less value it actually provides us. And when customers still continue to call us for help on issues we've already resolved, well, we know that's costing us money. So in KCS, we've got publishers who publish to self-service, and that's great if they wrote the article and then published it. But what about our candidates and our contributors? and they've either created knowledge which has a resolution, right? How do we effectively or efficiently identify that content and get it published as quickly as possible? Now, don't forget, publishers are working on issues with customers too. We don't wanna pull them away from that for content reviews. So what many of our customers successfully do is setting up automated KCS workflows to really ensure that nothing slips through the, the cracks and that they don't need publishers to continuously look for content that needs to be published. That content comes to them instead. So in my first example here, we've got an article that's validated, but by a contributor. So it's not available in self-service yet. But we've set a mechanism that specifies that once this is used a certain number of times internally to just go ahead and auto publish it to self service and then notify the publishers. Now in a KCS environment where reuse is review, how many more reviews do we need? It was put into validated, which meant the last person who touched it was confident in the resolution and adherence to the content standard. So let's do it. Right. But we also notified publishers. So, you know, we definitely have that, uh, 
trying to think of the word. We have that safety net, if you will, right? So we definitely have that in place. And in the second example, we've got a not validated article. Okay, so not validated does have a resolution, but the last person wasn't so confident in that resolution. But the resolution is there and it did help the customer solve their issue. So in this case, we wait on this a little bit, right? So let's say 90 minutes and you could set this to whatever time frame you're comfortable with. So if nobody else called in with that problem for somebody else to validate it, we're going to consider it okay to publish, even if it's been, you know, only if it's been used over a certain number of times by other knowledge workers, because remember reuse is review. So in this case, customers have opted to just auto publish and notify publishers instead of throwing it into a publisher's queue. But that's always an option as well. You could certainly do that where, where you're flagging that for a publisher to review and then make that determination. So, you know, the points on, on publishing quicker here is that don't rely on waiting until another customer calls in with the same issue to publish to self-service, right? If we've got it, we've got it documented. Let's see where we can make a big impact by getting that out there as quickly as possible and try to reduce the time it takes to check queues to see if something should be published. There's a lot of wasted time in there. A um, couple of last topics here. So in terms of one of the ways we evolve our people is through attention and recognition programs. But every day, the knowledge workers dashboard can provide them with visibility into the value they're creating by contributing what they know. Um, so a couple of things that we've done here to provide that insight is, you know, we've created a space where they can see this information that's updated in real time and it's built directly into the tool where they go to to create the knowledge. So authors can actually see a score that's specific to both the actions they take and the impact those actions have on the organization. You know, with KCS, we, we know that activity has a really low correlation of value, but as a knowledge worker, you want some reassurance that the actions you're taking are actually leading somewhere, right? So we've taken that into account and created a score based off a of formula which weighs activities versus outcomes. That way they can gauge how they're doing day to day and how the body of content they've created is doing as well because that does impact the score. You know, as content is used and either linked to cases or modified or I should say marked as helpful, um, things like that. And it's not about dinging people. Don't forget, it's not about dinging people, right? It's not about ranking them at all either. It's more about visibility to the overall impact. And, you know, they can also see more specific information based on the week. So how much of their content is actually being viewed, linked to cases, voted helpful or not helpful. And then the quality aspect, we don't want to forget about that. They can see their overall quality average, right? So, you know, this is another way to drive people to write, to, to actually create higher quality scores. You know, it's just the data they can see cumulatively for all the articles that they've published, what their actual quality score is. This guy has some work to do on his 72%. So, you know, we know how hard it is to work to be on top of polling stats like this. We've got a lot of things going on. We want to make sure that that people remain engaged. You know, this is one quick and easy way for them to remain engaged and, and see what they've done day to day on the knowledge. It gives them that more complete view. But you also want to think about um, other things that you need to provide your knowledge workers so they can see the value, right? It doesn't stop at the dashboard I just showed you. You know, everybody's a part of this team. And while they're seeing their the value here that they've provided, what about the bigger picture, right? What does that look like? What does customer success with self-service look like? How many times has their content been reused by other people on their team? Um, so being able to use your analytics, which lets you create reports, right? We've got a great console that lets you create a lot of great visuals like you see here. It helps you put together the story. You want to put the story together and share it with your knowledge workers. Um, but regardless of what tools you use, you want to determine what's important to your knowledge workers, right? What is going to keep them going and participating with KCS? Create your reports that tell that story and tell that story, right? Don't take that for granted. Establish a schedule and make sure that you stick to it because it's really easy um, to forget in the grand scheme of things, but it really is one of the most important things that you can do to just keep your KCS uh, practice going and going successfully. And I would fail as a KCS trainer if I didn't tell you to make sure that you are focusing on, act, not focusing on activities, right? It's about outcomes. Um, you know, it's about the value that they create. So make sure that's what you're providing. You know, do not provide reports about all activities because that becomes the focus. So be really careful. Um, so find what your story is, find what's most important to your knowledge workers and tell that story. 
Okay, so one last thing, and um, then we'll open it up for some questions. I just wanted to get into a bit of Evolve Loop automation here. Um, so, you know, I was talking about analytics just a minute ago, and we obviously don't stop when it comes to analytics in terms of enhancing our knowledge base, right? It's not just about our knowledge workers, but it's about everything that's happening there. So you want to think about how you can actually utilize the data from knowledge creation and the usage, right? Both really, really important. So if you have an analytics console, you want to really make sure you dive in, make the best use of it. You know, even though it might seem daunting at the beginning, if you can understand the data, how it drives your evolve loop, right? It's really going to be essential for your long-term success here. So, you know, what we've always done is, is we've looked at the reporting to provide valuable insights to our customers. And, you know, we've taken our reporting to another level where we've got drag and drop analytics, where you can actually get pretty fancy with all of the different kinds of reports that you create. So if bar charts are helpful, line graphs, pie charts, whatever the case may be, you can actually access all of the data behind what's happening with the knowledge and build what you need to tell those stories right? You know, there's a subset of articles, or I should not say articles, but reports, reports and analytics, that's, that's really fairly common across all companies. But then there's lots of different things that are not so common. So, you know, you can actually get in and use formulas, pivot tables. Um, so if you're an advanced analytics person, it's probably right up your alley, right? But you know, what I like is being able to identify, what do I need to do, right? Um, that's really where I want to go. And, and I get very excited um, with one of the tools that we have is that, you know, I understand where customers get frustrated and weeding through so many different reports to try to figure out, well, how do I know where I need to go, right? How do I know where, where report I need? How do I know what rabbit hole to go down, right? To look into different things. So, you know, we actually, you know, really thought about this a lot from a customer's perspective. And we looked for a way that machine learning could help with this task, right? You know, especially when we think about enhancing content for self-service. Um, and, you know, we wanted to have a tool that led towards making relevant improvements to knowledge. And we pulled a tool together that actually combines both the analysis of what users are searching for, what they used, how successful they were, and the ability to take action right there. So instead of analyzing reports and then building a list of what you need to do, you can simply analyze and then do because the information is provided at your fingertips. So, you know, what we've we've done is, is we've clustered um, search terms together under specific clusters, right? They're similar searches. We do this on a nightly basis where you can actually see, and you can see in my example here, how many different search terms were under the knowledge cluster. You know, if you look on the right, it shows us the percentage of success in this case is 66%. Um, let's me actually prioritize and work on clusters which didn't have great results, like the 25% one you see below. Um, so I can also dive into each specific search term and see all of the different sessions and users who use that term, what their outcome was, and even get into the nitty gritty details about their session. What did they do? It gives me their click track, right? What did they do? What did they search? What did they, you know, what else did they search for? And so on and so forth. Did they open a ticket? Can I see that, right? Everything I, I can get in and actually see the details. So in this case, I can tell it was a successful session. It's got a gold star next to it. And you can see all the details that it's provided. But if I go through and actually say, you know what, I want to work on this cluster. It's providing me at this point with a list of all the solutions that were viewed and used from the successful sessions. So I can even see solutions where the sessions weren't successful as well and even have general access to the whole knowledge base as well. So I can perform a lot of different tasks right from the actual cluster. So anything like adding keywords or creating new articles, completing it directly from within this analytical tool. So, you know, I'm just showing you a really quick overview of what this can do. So you get the basic idea, but one of my favorite aspects of the tool itself, because it does take a lot of guesswork out of it. Um, so one last thing before I open it up for questions here, you know, we're not you know, here at Right Answers, we're not just about the tools or the knowledge base that you use. You know, we support the KCS community beyond our Right Answers customers, of course. Um, so we have a team here of KCS certified trainers and consultants. You know, we really offer the 
full gamut of the official KCS training and certifications, many of which we have running on a monthly basis and across many time zones at the same time um, to accommodate all of your teams. And then we've also got programs that help you either you know, assist with or lead your KCS implementation to help you get up and running as quickly as possible. So, you know, we have goals in mind, you know, where we want to make sure, regardless of what tools you're using, that you roll out KCS successfully, you avoid any common pitfalls. Um, and we want to really empower your team so that they're successful um, in being successful with KCS, right? It's something I live and breathe day in and day out. And, and that's really um, what I live by is I want to see you be successful with rolling out KCS. I know how difficult KM can be to be successful with. And I know that KCS gets us, you know, as close as we can possibly get <laughs> as far as success goes. And then if you already are a KCS shop, we also have, you know, various consulting and, and health check services where, you know, we can come in and identify areas for improvement or just help you in areas where you think you might need some assistance with. But, you know, in any case, enabling your success starts with a good foundation of the KCS principles. Um, you know, we're offering that through training and then successful KCS programs. So, you know, regardless of what you might need help with, we can certainly help. And and, and, you know, it does not matter what tools you are using. We're certainly happy to help. Um, so with that, I um, wanted to see, I, I'm seeing questions pop up here somewhere. Yep. Um, yeah. There's actually, uh, Michelle, there's three questions in the chat. If you want to uh, start with those, that'd be tremendous. Absolutely. Let me see if I can grab the chat here. Okay. So the first one, uh, Jennifer put in how to drive uh, team motivation when measuring individuals. And then you see one from Janine and then one from. Uh, Got um, it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, great question. So how to drive team motivation when measuring individuals. So targeting the, the bigger than, than, than self. I cannot talk anymore today. Um, so in terms of, you know, just getting the motivation in there, you know, it really all starts with that initial buy-in, right? Um, ensuring that we have that. If we do have that in place, great. Um, you know, it does take a lot to continue having people be motivated. And, you know, what I've seen, you know, with the customers I've worked with is, is, what they don't often understand or clearly understand, I should say, is the processes behind the scenes of what happens with the knowledge once it's out of their hands. So, you know, we could show them, you know, how many times their article has been reused by customers or how many times it's been reused internally. And that gets us to a certain point. But then we also want to share what has this changed in our organization? Has our product or service changed, right? Has our process improved, right? What else has happened with that knowledge? Because that's all important too. And we were able to actually do those things based on the, the actual reuse from um, the knowledge. You know, one of the things I, I see time and time again when I'm sitting with agents is I see them linking random articles to their cases because no one's checking up on that. And, you know, once they realize what actually happens on the back end and what they're actually impacting, and in that case, negatively, um, they're kind of horrified that they were going through the motions of doing that. But at the same time saying, I wish I had known. I wish I had known where all of this led towards. So, you know, that's, that's one of the things too. When we see that changes happen, we're more motivated to actually participate. So um, that's definitely um, one area. And then from a team perspective, um, you know, I always think about, you know, some of the things customers have done, which have has taken me by surprise. Um, and there have been times where, you know, we have a gamification component where, you know, if you use it well, you can use it successfully with KCS, but you really have to think through how you're using it, right? Because there's definitely a lot of areas that you can, um, not not end up in a, a great place with but um, i had a customer who used the gamification component with starting out with a new knowledge base to get everybody's muscle memory in place of you know just performing these actions they did it um you know for a while and then you know one day i get a call and he tells me that he posted the the 10 bottom scores and you know we have that in our console where we have the leaderboard um and it's seen you know on the back end right so it's i can see it from an admin component um but i also call it you know uh, you know affectionately the loser board right it's not really called that but he told me he posted the loser board in the team chat um and it was really interesting because when people realized that they were the weak link 
they didn't realize they were impacting their team. And when he first told me he did that, I was absolutely horrified. I gasped. I said, why would you do such a thing? That's insane. And he said, no, 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 you would not even believe the outcome here. So where people were actually able to see that they weren't they weren't really holding up um, their end of the bargain from a team perspective, you know, that really helped to motivate them. But that's something you've got to be really careful with. You don't want to get into stack ranking um, because you don't want it to become a competition, right? You want, you want to figure out, you know, based on the tools that you're using and, you know, what you have um, available to you in your environment, you know, how do you, how do you do that? How do you get people to work more as a team? Um, one other way that I've seen a lot of, you know, high impact here is looking for those those real life stories, right? How has something impacted somebody on the team to the point where if you, you know, really tell that story and it's a compelling story, sharing that with the greater team gives people, you know, also the warm and fuzzies, right? That I, I, I will say as a side, but it gives people, you know, just that reassurance and those aha moments that, you know, you just can't, can't put any money on, right? It's just all that that value there. So a couple of ideas for you. Um, next question is where can you see the session track? Is that only if you're using cases through right answers? So, um, yeah, that's something we can reach out to and, and talk to you about. So yeah, you're able to, to view that. That would be if you had, um, that integrated with one of the, the case tracking tools. So if, from a standalone perspective, if you were just using right answers, you know, that's not something that's attached. It's gotta be attached to tracking the case or the incident. So we can reach out and have more of a conversation about that. Um, what's the best way to address the large amount of search results in your own knowledge base if you already use customer language for titles and keyword tags for articles? Um, that's a great question. So, you know, what I will typically um, look for first is I will start with a search report um, that tells me what the search terms are actually being searched for by that particular audience. So I would look at, you know, my self-service audience, what are the top search terms being put in and what are the results that come from that, right? So if you can kind of cross-reference those two lists and then I would work work through that. And it may be a case where you can pull things together into decision trees, um, you know, where you're curating content essentially. And with a decision tree, right, you essentially expose the top of the tree and then hide the remainder of the tree. So you're reducing the results that comes in. So that that's one way, uh, but I would definitely use that search reporting. And I'm happy to talk more on that if you wanted to reach out at any time. Um, good question. So how do you balance customer privacy, GDPR, security, personal data protection when the principles are based in referencing actual cases and tracking customer actions? Um, so, you know, if you're talking in terms of the knowledge, anything specific to a customer is not actually captured in the knowledge. Um, you know, if, if you, can you provide a little bit more detail in terms of what you were looking for there? And, and feel free to take yourself off mute also. So in case you're typing, um, you know, from a knowledge perspective, I'll, I'll give you time to type, um, but from a knowledge perspective, anything that's related to a specific customer should not be captured in the knowledge that should remain in the case. Um, so those details are locked nicely away in that actual case. As far as tracking customer actions, right? If you're tracking things that, you know, from a portal perspective, if, if they're logging into your self-service offering, right? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question in terms of, you know, how do you balance that privacy? Um, I haven't yet heard of a tool that doesn't track clicks and whatnot in terms of um, different groups. There was one company I did work with um, that actually wanted to capture, you know, what people were actually doing, but couldn't do from, so from a security perspective, so, you know, put something in place to actually shield usernames so you could still get the data, but you weren't actually seeing what the real username was to be able to tie it to a specific ID. You could get other information, right? Were they a self-service customer, things that are generic, um, but things like that. So it really depends on the angle that you're looking at. All right. And we have a, oh, Trevor's had a follow-up as well as Sue on that same topic. Uh, gotcha, okay. 
Yeah. So yeah, Travers. So yes, you are basing knowledge articles being connected to the cases. Yeah, absolutely. So typically what you have in the case is, are all of the details surrounding, um, you know, who's contacting you, what their issue is, but you know, what you have in the knowledge base is, is really the generic, right? The reusable content. So the issue itself, how it was resolved, the environment of where it's happening. So no customer details, of course, are in the actual knowledge base article. You're just connecting the article to the case. Um, but Sue, like you said, if you've got that concern, you know, in terms of tracking agent activity, yeah, that one, I, I completely understand certain countries are definitely strict about that. Um, and I think that depends on, on the country. I know that Germany is very, very strict where, you know, you really can't um, view all of the different actions. And I know that makes various areas of KCS very, very difficult, right? Um, but then also keeping it from being visible to other agents as well. So, you know, it's one of those things that it, it depends on the organization and where people are located, specifically if you're looking into the, into the session track, right? You know, if that's something where there was a concern, you probably could not enable that, or we'd have to to work to to program that in a sense, right? Where you'd be hiding who the particular agent was, but there's probably ways of figuring that out through the case details. So we probably need more, a little bit more information to see. You know, I don't think there's any concern in terms of being able to use it, but not use it in a valuable way, right? I think it's just a matter of what's exposed versus what's hidden um, or what's kind of, um, I don't want to say updated, but uh, not hidden, but, you know, not where it's, it's that person's blatant um, name or ID out there, but we could certainly have more of a conversation on that if you'd like. And, and many uh, companies will see, they'll use the radar charts where the individual can see how they compare to the team average on a variety of, of things, but they don't see how they compare to their actual teammates. And that uh, helps with deals with some of the privacy issues. But thank you. Um, and Thank you very much, Michelle. And it looks like we have uh, no more questions. So uh, this will be again, this is recorded. We're gonna send out the recording. And Michelle, if we could have, what we'll do is um, post not only the recording, but if you wanna share your slide deck, we can have that on the KCS Academy site too. So it's uh, up to you how much you'd like to share. Um, but we'd, uh, we'll definitely be posting on the Academy site. So with those who are on this call, you can feel free to share the, uh, these videos. Um, we'd like to get it exposed as much as possible. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks so much, Arnfin. I'll definitely send it over to you. Okay, great. Okay, Thanks. thank you.